No man has been mentioned on the show more without actually being on the show than Rich Rebar this summer. I cite his work on every single episode. You all know that. So today he's here in the flesh. Reeves, how are you, my friend? Oh, excellent. Listen, I've, I've owed you royalties for a long time, <laughs> uh, you know, working alongside you, doing the Sunday morning show. Uh, you've always promoted my work. I'm definitely gracious to have you in my corner and have your support. Uh, the other debut on the show is uh, Hayden's man bun today, by the way. Yeah, I figured uh, I, you can't be the only one getting roasted for, for hair in the comments. So I'm sure I'm coming coming next. More importantly, you can find all of Reeves' work right now on Sharp Football Analysis. Their draft kit, it's a lot of Ray, it's a lot of Reeves, is fantastic stuff. Fantastic. And I'll leave that link in the description down below. But most importantly, we have the five players you cannot stop drafting. So Reeves... Hit us with the first name. Who is it? Yeah, and I've got I've got a high priced player to start. And you know, we were kind of talking about just the lead in here when you probably have guests on the show and they're talking about the five players they can't stop drafting. It's probably often you know middle round picks or late round picks, guys that they they can get like almost at any point. You can take early, you can wait on. But I have a front round guy, um, and it's Tony Pollard. I uh, just literally can't stop hammering him because uh, he goes in the second round and he goes like kind of anywhere in the second round, but I think he should be a first round pick. So I just auto take him almost every second round. There's not many drafts. I don't, I, I pass on him. I think the gap between him and Austin Eckler should be tighter than what it is. And when you look at Pollard, I don't know what it is, right? It almost feels like when Eckler got the, the contract extension and the Chargers moved on from Melvin Gordon and people tried to talk themselves out of Eckler. I was one of those guys trying to talk myself out of like, wow, we're getting this hyper-efficient player and he's going to be a full-time running back. I guess we should jump off board now. And that's like what feels like we're doing with Tony Pollard. I mean, his his touches and yards have gone up every year of his NFL career. And with 232 touches last year, there's still room for him to still have even fewer than 300 touches and still have that go up for another year. Uh, he's played just 13 games where he's had 15 touches or more. And in those games, he's averaged just under 20 points per game, 113 yards per scrimmage. He's got 13 touchdowns in those games. Everyone knows like the game log when Zeke doesn't play. But there's really nothing here. Like, are we scared of Rico Dowdle? Are we scared of Malik Davis? They just signed Trayvon Diggs to a huge extension. Does that put them out of the market for trying to get one of these other kind of guys like a Leonard Fournette, uh, you know, or bring Zeke back? I don't really think so. So like, uh, I don't really understand like what the hesitation is with Tony Pollard. And he's definitely one of these guys that definitely can compete with the wide receivers. He's going around, mm -hmm. if not being the RB one overall. So I just auto scoop him in the second round every time. Yeah. I think early on he was priced down because we didn't know what his injury update was going to be off of coming off of that broken ankle, but he was back ready to go day one of training camp. That's super bullish. And we also didn't know if they were going to bring back Zeke. I still think there's a chance they bring back Zeke, but at, so much time has passed with Zeke that even if they do bring him back, it would be very close to the veteran minimum, in my opinion. And I don't think that they would go uh, back to the old Zeke role of years. Looking at it, Zeke, he was on pace for, for 10 touchdowns, uh, expected touchdowns last year off his usage. If Tony Pollard can get, let's say, half of that, we're talking about somebody that's going to be in the mix for top five touchdowns in addition to all the explosives that Tony Pollard brings to the table. Yeah, Reeves, Hayden and I have barely talked about Tony Pollard this offseason, so I'm Again, this is why you are here. This is why we do this show. So we get new names thrown in there. And that's pretty bad for a guy, like you said, is count constantly being drafted in the second round. I guess my concerns, and I would love to bounce these off of you, is he has never been an inside the 10-yard line guy. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you even wrote that just three of his touchdowns last year came yep. inside of the 10-yard line. Pollard has just 18 carries inside the 10-yard line through four NFL seasons. So on one hand, part of me thinks like, okay, he doesn't have to have that because he was still last year, what the running back eight in points per game as just being, you know, the second player on his team to get 190 carries versus the 230, whatever that Ezekiel Elliott got. Um, but the other part of me says, okay, if some of those explosives go down, we probably need more of the short yardage um, inside the 20, inside the 10 yard stuff. And so far, they haven't been willing to give him that. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, we don't know what the difference moving on from Kellen Moore is. We also don't know, like, I hate to draw, keep drawing this corollary, but like to Austin Eckler, right? Like Austin Eckler had the same career trajectory. His his entire career was built on explosives. It was one of the reasons I tried to talk myself out of him. And it's like, he's, he's never been a, he's also a smaller guy than Tony Pollard, right? Like people think Tony Pollard is like a small guy. He's 210 pounds. Like dude's a good mm -hmm. athlete. Right. Um, 
he just hasn't had those opportunities yet. But has he not had those opportunities because he's played with Ezekiel Elliott? Or is it? I think is, so. Is it, is it, yeah, that's that's where I'm kind of getting at. And then Austin Eckler was the same thing. When he got the opportunity to get those, he's literally scored 12 more touchdowns than any right. player in the right. NFL the last mm-hmm. couple of years. So are we really going to believe that even if the Cowboys like, you know, uh, Malik Davis or Rico Dowdle as like a the, the banger, like they're going to put those guys in like the no money chance. zone? And it, like it's, it's not the same scenario as like with Travis Etienne per se, who, you know, saw 40 carries inside the 20 yard line last year and scored just four touchdowns on them. Mm-hmm. And then the Jaguars prioritize the 88th overall pick and takes Bigsby, someone that can fulfill that role. The Cowboys have not, you know, flipped the coin and on the other side of it, have someone to take those unless we do get Ezekiel Elliott back. That, that That's the only thing. But I think that was a good example versus oh. ETN. When I'm watching Tony Pollard, it's not like I'm frustrated that he keeps bouncing it outside and he doesn't know how to run up the middle and all that stuff. I think he actually has good vision. He just has the explosiveness. There's It's never been a thing where like he can't run between the tackles. I think he can. It's just up to the coaching staff to let him get 18 touches, but even though that 16 touches Tony Pollard, we're still talking right. about a round two player. I think there's a chance that he can be the 19 touch guy, and that's how you sneak into the top 10. Yeah, Reeves, my brain again instantly jumped to well, if he gets more opportunities than his explosiveness, either for the stretch of games or for the entire season, will probably evaporate a little bit. Mm-hmm. Then again, the stat that you threw out there that in 13 games that he's reached at least 15 touches. He still averaged almost 20 fantasy points, 112 yards from scrimmage, and 13 touchdowns. So, like, even when he was given the 15 plus touches in the game, we still got massive production, even if it didn't come through pure explosive plays like it did last year. So, mm-hmm. on some levels, uh, he does a bit of everything. Okay, Reeves, who's next? Uh, my next guy is uh, another running back, running back centric show. But this, no more, the rest of these running backs, because I do have another running back after this guy, <laughs> more fit like the drafting meta because underdog has been for the past few years you know very sharp on you know i still think that the top end running backs are undervalued this year on underdog but in the dead zone the way they've handled like the mid-round running backs has definitely like course corrected itself on underdog more than any other site uh, that you could draft at so a lot of these guys kind of fit the meta the remaining guys but this is a very i think miss small hit big play and it's james cook and i'm curious to see how, how steamed up he'll get the last three weeks and if i do want to continue draft him if he's you know going at like rb 20 to 23 but james cook literally has a lot of the same pros we love for like a guy like jameer gibbs uh in his corner he is a a guy that's an efficient pass catching running back he's in an elite offense the thing that's holding him back is you know playing with a mobile quarterback and kind of like this fomo of like uh you know what if damian harris or latavius murray are actual things this year but Cook only had 110 touches as a rookie, 6.2 yards per touch. He was one of the highest rated running backs in percentage of carries that resulted in a first down. He was a, a standout in yards per route run. He was not only a standout in targets per route run, but targets beyond the line of scrimmage, which it, it, running backs, you know, you get a lot of those check downs, right? Like we look at Ramondre Stevenson, all the targets he got. And it's hard to say like they're they're one effective types of targets because they're just checkdowns, and then two if they're just a byproduct of all the injuries the Patriots wide receivers had and how sticky they carry over. Uh, but you look at Cookie's getting targets that actually matter at running back when he is targeted. Josh Allen was a guy that did throw to running backs at a decent amount for a mobile quarterback. Now we remove Devin Singletary. What if Damian Harris just isn't a thing, right? Like I like Damian Harris as a player, but like we've seen a lot of guys like Damian Harris kind of come and go in the NFL. So, like, what if he's just there as insurance for James Cook? They like, obviously, James Cook for the draft capital he has, what he brings to the table. Everything's been positive this summer. The, the question is, how many carries can we get, like, not vultured in that, in the, like, the, the ceiling touchdowns, right? The money, the money plays or what's kind of that's going to hold up James Cook. That's why I think he's more of a miss small player where he is now. But the ceiling, I think, is still, like, he can be arbitrage on a guy like Jameer Gibbs. Yeah, this is a very tricky one, and I haven't been drafting him much, but this is one of the players where I'm like, could least lose some sleep over because the upside I think is there. He only had one game above fifty percent snaps mm-hmm. as a rookie, and I think that is kind of the player archetype issue that he has because he is so small. But the, the offense is undergoing changes, and we've seen that in the draft and their statements, uh, and even in free agency too. Damian Harris has been injured right now. Uh, Latavius Murray actually had more guaranteed money. So I think those two are battling for this goal line role. So to me, I think like in full PPR and in managed league, I do think that James Cook will have some value because I think he's going to be a relatively consistent player because I think he will be 
uh, available for early down touches and he will be in the two minute drill. The total upside thing is the thing I keep trying to find a path for because these 190, 195 pound running backs, it just doesn't happen that often, especially if you have G uh, Josh Allen. Yeah, and I think the total upside has to come through touchdowns, and that's the biggest question at this point. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, Reeves, this has also been a blind spot for me. Maybe Hayden and I have a little bit too much group thing going on with James Cook. Um, but to your point, among quarterbacks with 80-plus rushing attempts, Josh Allen does lead them all in checkdown rate. So, like, the reception should be here. It has been clear to see from, like, year one of Josh Allen to whatever we're year at now for Josh Allen, like, he has improved going through his progressions and getting down to the check down. So like the receptions angle, I am not uncertain about um, mm -hmm. the Damien Harris plus the Tavius Murray plus Josh Allen dynamic of, OK, when the pads are flying, when it is the third quarter, we're down by three. We need a touchdown um, is has James Cook won that role. And do we know that during preseason action? But even going back to our conversation with Ryan Heath about breakout age, it is these year two running backs that really do break out most likely into the top 12 of their position. And you're able to get James Cook right now as running back 29, 88th overall. So I love that point, Reeves, of, hey, if this is a miss, it's going to be a small miss. But if it is a hit, then maybe you are getting, again, a top 12 scoring running back all the way at running back 29 on a team that we know is going to put up a bunch of points and a bunch of touchdowns and maybe just more of those go to James Cook than we are expecting right now. And so much with the Bills is uh, going to be such a fulcrum point of how Dalton Kincaid plays in the run game. Because if Dalton Kincaid, if they want to play more 12 personnel and they're going to come out and show 12 personnel, but Dalton Kincaid's just going to be a wide receiver, teams are going to acquiesce to that and start defending him like he's a wide receiver. And you're not going to get those uh, you know, those base packages that on defense, right? Like they're going to be in more nickel and stuff to combat. If they're just treat them like a wide receiver, basically. Right. But if they're able to run the football out of those sets, then it's going to be so good for James cook because it's going to give them so much more offensive flexibility uh, when Dalton Kincaid's in the game. So I'm really excited to see how like Dalton Kincaid is incorporated and how he actually plays in the run game. Hayden, I don't know if I've asked myself the question enough of what if James cook is just the dude. I, and that's where I am losing some sleep over because he he's certainly explosive and he is one of these guys I do think was primed to take a second and third year leap. It just is he thick enough to handle the goal line role? That's I mean the hold up. the risk team over at Underdog the pick and projections just three and a half rushing touchdowns for James Cook as the projection six hundred rushing yards. I feel like that's obtainable for sure. Like if if, if I was trying to find an angle, I do think the rushing yards going to be there because I don't envision them handing the ball to Latavius Murray at the 50 yard line. I do think they'll try to make that change up. <laughs> right. Be James cook trying to get these explosives. Like this might be one of those situations where we have a between the twenties player and an inside the twenties player. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause we've seen teams across the league. And if we can follow the money while it was very small to Damian Harris and Latavius Murray, their body type, what Damian Harris did a couple years ago during Ramondre's, I believe rookie year was, you know, owning that inside the 10 yard line work. But if James Cook is still there between the 20s, like you said, that 600 and a half rushing yards, higher or lower, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, okay, we've seen, you know, uh, in just a small sample of when they've had to just lean on one guy or, had, you know, when Devin Singletary, the, uh, you know, Devin Singletary is not as good a player mm -hmm. as James Cook. He's been awesome for fantasy football when they've had to just give him like 15 plus touches. So if we can just kind of get into like that Pollard strike zone we talked about, yep. like if we can get James Cook around that like 14 to 16 touches, I think he's really going to be – he's going to pay off there. Uh, you all can take these pick -em projections for NFL season in the link in the description down below. I will match your first deposit up to $100 if you use promo code the show or just click the link. All right. Take us to wide receiver land, Reeves. Yeah, I mean, this one. This one's actually going to be like the – almost like the anti-Reeves take. I don't have like a lot of bells and whistle stats for this dude. I just think he's crazily underpriced. That's Brandon Cooks. Uh, I actually am like dumbfounded where he goes and drafts, especially in context of the wide receiver position. I mean, this is a guy that's done nothing but be good at football, playing with functional quarterback play and sometimes subpar fun quarterback play. And now he's going to be playing with the, the best quarterback he's had since Tom Brady. Uh, he's going wide receiver like 42, wide receiver 44. So there's no way he doesn't beat that. I also think the Cowboys in general, I know a lot of people like are like, 
kind of don't know what to do with the absence of Kellen Moore. They heard Mike McCarthy's comments about running real football. Look at the Cowboys personnel. And you heard a little bit of this if you listen to the Jordan Rodriguez Play Callers podcast. Like coaches are going to find out like who, what their best unit is on the field. And when you look at the Cowboys personnel, there is no way you can say that the Cowboys best personnel is not an 11 personnel and they're going to spread the spread teams out. Like, granted, this defense might be good enough to where, like, they don't have to do a lot in the second half of games, and maybe that pulls some of this in. But the Cowboys removed Zeke Elliott from their offense. They removed Dalton Schultz, the succubus, from their passing game. And now they're getting a Michael Gallup back another year uh, off of his ACL, and you add, like, a more consistent just player of uh, wide receiver position in Brandon Cooks. Like, this offense is is set up to live in 11 personnel. Uh, I'm not nearly as scared as other people. I'm definitely not at wide receiver 42 pricing. I mean, I'd rather have Brandon Cooks over like 15 wide receivers that go ahead of him. Wow. Um, it's it's absolutely crazy, I think, where he's going. I, I have him projected as like a like right on like the wide receiver two, wide receiver three line. And you're able to get him as a wide receiver four. Uh, like I said, I don't have a lot of great, awesome stats to back up with this. I can say if you are a fan of Matt Harmon's work, Brandon Cook still was really good in reception. Yes. reception. Uh, he just kind of quiet quit last year. He wanted out of there. And you can't blame him for that. This is this is such a good circumstance for him. They need somebody that can win a little bit downfield, and obviously Brandon Cooks could do that. I still think he has plenty of juice left. And like you're showing here on the screen, there's a lot of kind of like number two, number three types that are in front of him that just play in way worse offenses. Like I love Jahan Dotson. I think that Jahan Dotson can kind of be like Brandon Cooks in real life. But if you're giving me Sam Howell versus Dak Prescott, I have opened my eyes up to what you said, Reeves, where in the beginning – of the offseason, I was like, all right, what's going on here with McCarthy? Looking at some of the the, the slow-paced offenses he ran, but you could make an excuse that that was Aaron Rodgers wanting to audible and change things up. Dak Prescott has wanted to play fast entirely, and you just can't run the ball in this offense. The The wide receivers are too good. Dak Prescott's too good to do that. Yeah, I love gut feel, Reeves. Absolutely love him <laughs> making an appearance. On it's show. not often you get get a feel based take from me, but uh, I it feels mean, nice I just, when you do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. You know, I don't have the hair to let down out of the man bun, but you know. <laughs> trust the tape, as we always say. Okay, who's next on your list, Reeves? Uh, my next guy is uh, Rashad Penny. I think this is just you know Howie being Howie, man. Howie's in his bag here. Like this is such an Eagles signing. Uh, you get just a hyper efficient player in. Now just this great offensive environment, like this great scheme fit. Uh, he's going to have insurance as well. And so Penny is like the one like underdog pick, right? Like he's a guy I don't think I'm going to draft a lot like this final month in redraft leagues because of like the cattywampus like touchdown dependency and like trying to play that whack-a-mole game on the week, like in my weekly lineups. But in these best ball leagues where he goes like, oh, he fits this to a T, man. And especially, like I said, the, the wide receiver meta and the half point PPR, like, man, he is, he is such a great pick for this format. Um, obviously everyone knows like all like the great efficiency stats that like the past two years, he's like the number one running back in EPA per run. He leads off like running backs, uh, in yards per carry. He's very Nick Chubby and like efficiency just hasn't had like the, the run of health. Maybe we do get a healthy season with, uh, like him kind of, you know, uh, sharing work with DeAndre Swift and some Kenneth Gainwell. Maybe the Eagles are able to just keep him fresher and alive. But when you look at like this fit too, uh, I had this in the running back tiers, but I'll repeat this because he's some just bonkers stats. Uh, obviously, you know, with Jalen Hurts, the Eagles led the league in percentage of runs with runs out of shotgun, running back carries, not quarterback runs. 85% of their running back carries were out of shotgun. Penny only has 62 carries out of shotgun the past two years, which actually is like a high percentage of his carries because he's, he's always been hurt. He's averaging seven yards per carry on those attempts. That's a pass attempt. Like that's, that's like better than <laughs> God. Like that's like league, league pass attempts were set, what? 7.1 mm -hmm. yards last year. Like, and that was without the Eagles offensive line. And okay. Yes. This in Seattle and you know, and he only got to play a few games with their rookie tackles, but like the year before the offensive line was trash. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the one bug boon with keeping like everything is like his price down is like obviously the health and that he hasn't caught any passes, but like, we're not counting on the Eagles to throw a lot of passes. He's going to be more touchdown dependent, but when he has spike weeks, like you're just going to get them in this format. Like you're just yeah. going to, they just go in your lineup. Uh, so he's a guy that I think does like for this format. I've just been just hammering it anytime I can get him where he's at. Uh, I don't know how much I'll draft him when I like, I'm, I'm in these like said weekly lineup setting leagues, but I mean, I think he's just a fantastic pit for the pick for this format. 
I was looking at his last 10 games played, and obviously here comes the YouTube comments about how he's never healthy, of course, sure. blah, blah, blah. We're only talking about injured players, Hayden. That's all we It's do. insane. He's been a top five running back on the week in five of his last 10 games. Talking about Spike Weeks, five of his last 10 games. So my official stance after reading all of the Eagles reports from training camp, I think DeAndre Swift will be in the mix on early downs and some third downs, and they'll try to scheme him up some passes. Kenneth Gainwell is going to be in the two-minute drill because they actually do like Kenneth Gainwell. And then Rashad Penny is going to be in like a worse version of the Miles Sanders role. Mm -hmm. But Rashad Penny can still get there in some of this Miles Sanders role. I think at the goal line, week one, who's the running back at goal line? If I had to guess right now, it would be Rashad Penny. So he's my favorite of the three to draft. Yeah, the high value touches and how the Eagles divvy them out is just so different than the Lions or mainly any other team across the league. Like what we care about, the high value touches in this team is the red zone the inside the 10, the inside the five. It's a touchdown scoring opportunities. Um, I don't know. A, a he doesn't of- always fully need just like the bunny. The thing about Rashad Penny is he doesn't just need the bunnies. Like totally. we talked about Pollard and the explosives. Like yeah. he yeah. can hit 30 yarders. Totally. I'm, I'm totally with you. My, I guess my thing and – Again, I appreciate all the feedback that we do get. I think at times, though, right now is people reading into, oh, now the Eagles offense is changing their ways to incorporate more running back receptions and running back in the receiving game. Maybe I'm a pessimist, but I'll believe it when I see it, because I just don't think that the Eagles need to do that to sustain the level of offense that they've had in the past. And when you actually consider the investment that they made in DeAndre Swift is basically equal to that of Rashad Penny. Like Mm -hmm. the investment they have in DeAndre Swift is not big. It's really not big at all. It's like a 2025 fifth round pick or something ridiculous. Like you never see that ever. So again, maybe that does happen, but it would be a hard right turn on a team that is already so difficult to defend with their duo or inside zone then we've talked about with RPOs and tight end screens. And then when you fill a man in the box, then boom, you have these vertical shots of Devontae Smith and AJ Brown on the outside. We've just never seen Jalen Hurts type quarterbacks check down to their running backs or have them in the flow of the passing game. And again, maybe I'm off. I just do not expect the pathway for DeAndre Swift to hit as easily as a healthy uh, Rashad Penny in this environment. Yeah, Swift goes ahead of a guy like we talked earlier, James Cook, very much similar archetype and probably doesn't have as clear as a as a run out as even James Cook has. Yeah, I should mention that Rashad Penny is being drafted as running back 34, uh, 103 overall. These are the names. You can tell how I've been drafting like in the meta, right? Like, you know, I like Tony Pollard and then we're going to take a bunch of wide receivers like everyone else Mm -hmm. is dictating. And then I'm coming back in this area of the draft, right? And I'm trying to get guys here and, you know, to throw at that RB2 spot and and see what happens. In this time frame, it's it's uh, James Cook and Rashad Penny, both listed right there. All right, close this out. Your final name is who? Yeah, my final guy is more of another underdog pick, uh, and it's Geno Smith. You know, I think he just fits basically like any way you want to do it. If you took an early round quarterback, you can get Geno Smith. If you're baking like a, a Frankenstein quarterback, it's Geno Smith. He just fits kind of the structure, uh, and this, his price point is so good. Uh, he was literally one of the best stories of last year, you, you know, easily like we, we love a redemption story. And, you know, granted, should he should you win comeback uh, player of the year just for coming back from the grave? I don't know. It's not for me to say he wasn't really hurt. But, hey, uh, he threw multiple passing touchdowns in 12 games. Only Patrick Mahomes did that and tied him. Patrick Mahomes had 12, 12 games. Um, and I think when, when you go back to Geno Smith, you look at not just his sample last year, but also his sample from 2021. And this offense was different with Geno Smith. Now, we throw small samples out a lot, but imagine if just mm-hmm. we would have taken that small sample from Geno Smith and applied what that Seahawks offense looked like with Geno Smith and what Geno Smith looked like and what Russell Wilson looked like and applied that more to last year, we would have saved a lot of heartbreak uh, <laughs> along the way of a lot of players. Um, but I think he, he grasped the system. Also, like the Seahawks were not like your throwback Pete Carroll Seahawks last year. They were 11th in the NFL in drop back rate. Only the Chiefs, had a higher drop back rate than the Seahawks inside the 10 and inside the five. 
like this wasn't quite like your your third throwback Seahawks team. And now you add Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, to a team that was 26 and 11 personnel rate. That's going to go way up. I mean, everything just kind of points to Geno Smith kind of being like a great buy um, and, and believing, like like I said, not just the one year sample, but going back into those four games of 2021, that he's got a grasp on the system. He's got great weapons. Um, he's got a really good schedule, especially op- over the opening half of the year. Um, and they've also got like a really good tight end Voltron unit. Like, you know, you might not like any of those guys like individually, but like it's a productive unit when you put them all on the field and the offensive line that we talked about the, the two tackles they took last year. Uh, that's an improved offensive line. I mean, everything about Geno Smith just screams value at QB 15. I say like, I don't know in one quarterback leagues why I always want to target him because I'll probably have a quarterback by the time like he comes around and maybe he doesn't have like that ceiling archetype of the dual threat guys that you might be able to get like later, like an Anthony Richardson or, or Deshaun Watson. But if you miss out on all those guys, I mean, man, Gino's just hanging out here, man. Uh, just, just chilling. He also added 21 yards per game on the ground, which is like just above that kind of like Joe Burrow mm-hmm. line. So he can get freaky with it a little bit. To me, it was just like his accuracy was so absurd. And when I was writing my Seahawks preview, I went back to that 2021 season and, in all of these underlying metrics, the big time yeah. throw rate, the success rate, the EPA, the completion percentage of they were all really good. So it wasn't like it was just like last year was a fluke. He's done this for now like 20-ish games in a row. And I just think that the the whole unit, the personnel, the coaching staff, everything's such in lockstep. Everyone complements each other to a T. And I just think that Geno Smith, if he is in this like Kirk Cousins distributor label, and I think that's what he is he is in an ideal environment for that to matter again. Yeah. He's going as quarterback 15, 115 overall. Uh, when a team, as you've written, Reeves, is so good at scoring outside of the red zone, like naturally we expect those explosive rates to just go down. So when that does happen, I ask myself what area the team can compensate to make up for that loss. And it's exactly what you put out there, that they were 26 in the league and 11 personnel. And so now pulling that lever of, oh, we're going to add a first round wide receiver to maybe create the best trio of wide receivers in the NFL other than the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, And then on top of it, if you don't score as often in the end zone or inside the red zone or outside the red red zone, I should say, inside of it, they could have been much better. They were 27th in red zone TD success. So again, there are these different mechanisms where it wasn't hitting perfectly or hot last year. So again, if something that did waivers tapers off, then boom, we have other areas and not even including Zach Charbonnet, who again can be probably better in that um, inside the 10, inside the five yard area too. I'm, I'm really all in on this Seahawks offense and why we argue with ourselves of, okay, who should be taken before? Is it JSN or Tyler Lockett? And, Maybe some of the stuff comes from DK. Maybe the answer is, hey, just invest in Geno Smith as quarterback. I mean, it's the way to play it, right? Like, it, it, you know, no one really knows, like, what Jackson's been thinking about, how he's going to impact the target shares or, like, the the slot rate for Tyler Lockett, right? Like, we don't really know, but we know that there's a primary beneficiary for all these guys, that it's the pa- it's the throw at quarterback. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is. All right, Reeves, you are the freaking man. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that everyone needs to go and check out the Fantasy Football Draft Kit over at Sharp Football. It is endless resources. If you hear me cite a stat that is attached to Rich Rebar's name, it came from this stuff all summer, um, and it's been fantastic. I mean, team previews, tiers, projections, all of it, and you're still adding stuff. Um, yeah, we're doing the rest of the rest of the month, trying to living, breathing, you know, we're updating as injuries happen. Uh, anyone that's listening to this, if you guys want to use the promo code SHARP20, you can get 20% off, you know, anything over at the site. Absolutely love that. I'll oh, put yeah. that link in the description down below. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. Once again, hit subscribe. We're on the road to 60,000 subscribers here Ooh. on this channel. Tomorrow, the first episode of Scheme launches with a new co-host about the Chargers offense and their explosive plays diving into Kellen Moore's playbook beyond the lookout for that. And as you know, we've got content every single day on the channel. And if you're listening to us on the audio feed after this, take 10 seconds and leave us a review. It truly does help this time of year with the charts, with the rankings, all that stuff. We would truly, truly appreciate it. All right. Up the villa. We'll talk to you soon. See ya.